So uh, thank you everybody for joining us today. We've got a esteemed collection of experts in the payment space. So I'm just going to briefly introduce our panelists and then I'm going to give a brief rundown of how we're going to organize the flow of today's panel. It's going to be a mix of a presentation and then a panel to foster a good vibrant discussion amongst our panelists. But I want to just make sure you know everybody knows if you have any questions throughout the session, just please type them in the chat and we'll get to them, you know, at the end of the session or if it's relevant, you know, in the course of our discussion. But I'm going to kick off first by just giving a rundown on the topics we're aiming to discuss on today's panel. So once we get through a brief introduction of our payment hub, the topics we want to discuss center around real-time payments. We also want to look at cross-border remittances and how we're working on tool sets to enable that last mile delivery of payments as well looking at stuff like the ISO 222 standard. We're gonna explore what's happening around the world regarding open banking, whether it's market driven or regulatory driven and some of the initiatives around third party payment initiation APIs. We're gonna explore digitizing merchant payments and the challenges and opportunities of enabling this two-sided market. And although we talked about open G2P yesterday, we might try to cover bulk payments in G2P if we have time as well. Sorry about my slides not moving properly. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to kick off by briefly introducing an open source tool that the Mifos initiative has been developing and maintaining, which provides a great tool for the FINRAC community to connect into various payment systems. So Ishvan's gonna go into more detail about our Payment Hub Enterprise Edition, but wanted to give you a little bit of background on its origin and what it does and how it's being used. So the Payment Hub you know, was developed with funding and support from both the Digital Impact Alliance as well as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We built out the first prototype in 2019 with efforts led by Ishvan and his team at DPC. And then throughout 2020, we developed the production ready version of it and deployed it in a lab environment and added a number of support for use cases for MojoLoop, which is a real-time payment system as a reference implementation of the Gates Foundation's level one principles. And with the Payment Hub, you know, the original vision was really to provide this open source bridge that when you connect it to MojoLoop along with Finneract and Mifos for account management, you can provide an end-to-end -end open source architecture for digital financial services. And Ishvan will talk more about what the Payment Hub does, but its original use case was really to allow DFSPs or various financial institutions, whether they be SACOs, MFIs, banks, or mobile money operators to easily connect into a MojoLoop switch. And with you know providing this end-to-end -end architecture, what we really hope to foster is enable this long tail of adoption and innovation that can occur at the account and app level, which is where you know Mifos and Finnerac provide those open source building blocks to really fuel innovation that can happen on top of all the different payment rails that are moving forward across the world. Ishvan's going to talk more about our lab environment. So first off, I just wanted to, at a high level, touch on what you know the Payment Hub does. So first off, it provides that integration layer and a gateway to easily connect into external payment systems by just building simple connectors. So by default, we've built out the MojoLoop connector. We've been working on an ISO connector. And then we're now working on connectors to the various mobile money APIs worldwide. It also is built on top of the ZB uh, workflow engine developed by Komunda, so it provides an elegant way to orchestrate not only payments, but processes as well. It provides an operational control center to give a DFSP that's participating in a payment system visibility into the transactions that are occurring. And then it also provides analytics in these transactions. And this is just showing, you know, the payment hub and what it can do alongside Finneract. So here, you know, this graphic shows just the orchestration layer that payment hub provides in the various services within Finneract and how they interact but Ishvan will go into more detail when he looks at the specific architecture of Payment Hub. And then just wanted to you know, show how whatever type of institution, whether it's a FinTech, a financial institution or a regulator, the Payment Hub can be a key open source asset to help those users get the most uh, value out of a real-time payment system or a mobile money system, whatever payment rail it might be. And then I'm gonna skip over this as Ishvan will speak to these benefits. And then just real quick, wanted to show, you know, where the payment hub is being deployed or looked at being deployed right now. 
So right now we've been extending the payment hub to support some of the G2P use cases as part of our open G2P efforts in Sierra Leone. We're kicking off a couple projects to build out connectors to M-Pesa to enable M-Pesa integration for a few different users in East Africa. One of our partners, Finnerfin, has leveraged Payment Hub to provide a closed loop wallet system based in India. And then we're looking at integrating with some of the Mojo Loop pilot efforts in Myanmar, as well as East and West Africa. And then later on in today's panel, Victor is gonna speak to some of the efforts around Kodi and merchant payments. So I'm going to pass it on to you, Ishvan. I think you're going to take control of mm -hmm. the slides, but Ishvan is going to give a little bit more detailed overview of the Payment Hub architecture, the tech stack, and you know what's in future on the roadmap. And then we're going to go into the discussion. So. Yeah. Um, you need to release the screen if I want to take it over. Mm, yep. This okay. Way. You got and, it. Yeah. Um, good. So here I am. Yeah, and let me hit the present button. Perfect. So just some intro of what is this payment hub and what are we doing? So the intention that the core banking platform is good at managing the accounts, doing all the accountings, the general ledgers and postings and all the related uh, operations. But then you do payments and you need to interact with different payment schemes. Then there's the first challenge that most of these schemes are asynchronous. So you say something and at a different time, they give you some response back that you need to deal with. Sometimes they time out, so you need to retry. Sometimes they are not responding at all and then you need to do something else. Um, sometimes error messages are coming back, of course, and you need to deal with this situation, potentially give the money back to the customer that you were blocking his account. So that's why taking all this logic, what I explained, is probably better to do it in a specialized engine rather than in the core banking uh, system itself. And that's why came this idea that in, in this whole industry, uh, the account management and orchestrating all these payments uh, makes sense to separate them. And how a payment looks like that someone, if it's initiated by the bank, then someone from one of the channels of the bank initiate this transaction, so wants to send some funds. Obviously, it's possible to move funds from one account management or even to one account to another account and use the payment hub to orchestrate this in-house uh, payments, but it's much more relevant and it goes uh, out of the organization. So the instruction comes in and this orchestration engine responsible to deal with the situation. So find the corresponding account management system. Um, I probably want to highlight that the option here that we by default providing connectors to our FINERACT uh, platforms uh, the necessary changes in the platform is now part of the core uh, system, uh, but the whole platform is easily configurable to use other core bankings, uh, other core banking platforms. So the engine and the logic remains the same, uh, but the integration to the core banking can be added easily. And um, then besides these account management systems, we do deal with the different payment schemes uh, the Mojo Loop is one of the schemes that we initiated this whole uh, engine. Uh, but since that, we added the ISO 20 or 22 uh, connectors, which deal with the standard SWIFT PAX 008 and 002 messages, um, which are used in multiple countries that the real time uh, payment is already introduced. Uh, on top of this basic flow, I would say including all of these timeout handlings and error uh, handlings, an additional option that in some cases being it outgoing or being incoming transaction from one of these schemes, you want to detect or you want to at least check some kind of fraud situations. So an external engine could be incorporated into the flow. And if the decision that this is a no-go, then we can stop the payment to happen or put it to a separate account before humans could review the transaction and do something with it. So that's roughly the engine. Um, and um, the idea that we use 
a very similar stack what we use in the Apache Finera uh, core banking platform. So Java Spring Boot, that's all common. Um, Kafka obviously required insight to handle some of the asynchronicity. Um, and what we use is Apache cameras in these different connectors. And the probably the interesting piece of this solution is the stateful orchestration engine that we pick the common the ZB engine uh, that is seems to be pretty suitable for this type of task. Um, what is happening inside? Uh, so this is as the diagram suggests, this is a Kubernetes cluster. These boxes represent represents the different containers in the solution. Um, in the middle, the only probably only is too much, but but this real stateful engine who participates in the real-time transaction is the ZB engine running in a cluster, uh, having rocks DB in the instances and using rough protocol. Uh, to do consensus and replication of all that data. So no special or centralized database or single point of failure in this uh, uh, cluster. And all the connectors which do the connections to the um, external systems are simply stateless connectors. They take the task from this orchestration engine, they communicate with their external system. If synchronous, then they wait, they provide the data. If it's asynchronous, like with the payment schemes, most of them, or all of them, I would say, uh, then they send the message and that's it. And when a response or callback comes in, then they pass it on to the engine to orchestrate the process correlated, find the corresponding uh, process instance on any of the nodes, and handle the situation. And all the other part is just like we are in a bank. So make sure that we do audit all of the events. Uh, we do have an operations application who operators could interact with the system. They can review, they can look up transactions, uh, what is happening. So that's something that is uh, going inside. And also they can do some actions like a fraudulent transaction, they can proceed or they can reject the transactions. Um, if it's timed out, uh, then needs a manual resolution that they can interact with the application and do something with those uh, payments. So roughly, that's the system what we are talking about. Um, and um, obviously, multiple nodes, um, cluster, um, clustered solutions for all of these pods that, that could help uh, to provide higher availability. So if I put this engine into the context of a bank, that this is our DFSP, has the multiple channels, being it a teller at the branch or being it a mobile phone or an internet uh, application, and one or multiple account management systems, and our engine is the one which connects it to the different networks like the module uh, network. This is inside the engine. So that's the process flow. And this is a model, a graphical model in BPMN, but actually this is the real executable flow that is uploaded to this engine. And the different events or the different tasks are happening in this order. The color coding is for easier understanding. Uh, so what, what happens with the account management system with uh, um, with our platform, what happens with the module loop network? So we send the transfer request and we wait for a response. And if the response is not coming, then we retry uh, because that's the module loop specification that how to handle those kind of situations. If it's still not happening after a couple of retries, uh, then uh, we need to pass this on to an operator to figure out that what happened with the transaction, do some kind of reconciliation or call the other parties to figure out what happened. And once this resolution is done, then the engine could continue that process and either book or cancel the uh, rejected uh, transaction in our systems. So that's the real model. Um, and I would say that the choice of getting um, a process engine here and makes the integrations, the integrator's job easier because this flow is, is never going to be exactly the same. You're always going to have something that needs to be tuned and having an engine makes a lot of sense because it becomes much easier to modify um, and even redraw this uh, process flow or add additional flows that the given uh, country or the given deployment is required. Um, 
I want to be quick on on this, so it's part of the deck you could you could check. But the idea that um, we need a solution which can run on premise could could uh, run on cloud. We use this in Azure and also in AWS uh, with different deployment setups. So so it's all pretty easy. I would say yeah, you have a Kubernetes cluster and all of these ports can be deployed. Um, uh, what is an what was another consideration that the real-time engine, which is really required to complete a process, and all of these backend processes, collecting, audit, logging, and whatever, these are really separated, uh, and we don't bother the real-time processing uh, while the operators are doing checkings and, and other uh, reporting and other activities. Um, so that's that's the that's the idea, and as I mentioned, that this orchestration. Uh, makes the deployment or the, let's say, the customization of the solution easier. Uh, because the engine in the single uh, or in its runtime is handling the timeouts, all the correlations of the asynchronous events, all the errors and exception scenarios, um, uh, provides a view on the in-flight transactions. And for the integrator who needs to do the connectors for different schemes, the job becomes quite simple, single synchronous transactions and transformations to handle. Heavy lifting is, is remaining inside the engine. Um, and the, the suitability of the CB engine, um, I would say that's the key. So we did uh, now plenty of performance testing and uh, the, the new style that it's using graph protocol and rocks db uh, for its storage on all of these nodes makes it possible to handle um, millions of transactions so the so the concurrency that how many concurrent transactions we could run it's it's very high and also the performance under uh, certain so under significant load is quite okay and um, so that makes it suitable for the even this type of real-time uh, payment flows um, yeah, uh, some other considerations, how to reach five, uh, nine availability with this solution. So if, if it's really a, a tier one bank wants to deploy this solution, then the multiple data centers could be utilized and the engines could run parallel across and even a complete side failure uh, can be compensated with this way. Of course, if you don't need all of that and you go for minimal or development environment, just a single instance of everything, in a single Kubernetes cluster, even on your laptop. Okay, you need some memory for that laptop, but 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 so it still could be deployed really in a minimal or bare bone situation. Uh, you can go further um, uh, with with multiple nodes and multiple instances of everything, and then you can go further to deploy to multiple data centers and multiple independent real-time engines servicing. Uh, the uh, requirements. Okay, uh, the CB engine is, there's lovely details here that why, why it's chosen and what's the benefit. Um, surprisingly, it runs VPM and processes uh, and that's, um, and, and that's, I would say a benefit uh, because understanding the process flow, modifying the process flow comes uh, quite easy and it's really scalable horizontally adding uh, multiple nodes and uh, multiple copies of the processes uh, so this type of failures can be tolerated um ed where are we with timing so sure uh, and just like the next minute or two we we're gonna go into the discussion portion so if you can wrap up with what you're presenting Istvan, yeah does that work yeah, of course, of course. So, so besides the payment hub in this environment, uh, what we have also explored that adding API gateways, uh, so making the DFSPs or the banks open for fintechs. So providing the open banking API, and now multiple fintechs could integrate with all of these institutions who are opening up uh, those uh, services. And um, in this scenario, uh, additional applications could be developed by fintechs to to reach those accounts and um, yep and um, one a couple of words on our lab 
environment. So we do operate in Azure, an environment that has six DFSPs or six banks, all connected with a single module. Um, and all of them utilizing uh, Fineract 1.x and also a CN instance, both having multiple tenants, two tenants in our case, and all of them having the payment hub. As we designed the payment hub to be also multi-tenant capable, so with a single deployment, we can serve uh, multiple tenants inside uh, Fineract. Yeah. And um, I would get back to you. Okay, yeah, I'll take over screen share, but that's the right slide to be on. So thanks, Istvan. And the first area we're going to open the discussion to was around real-time payments. And so Istvan, you know, I just wanted you to just open a little bit briefly, you know, touching on based on all your experience, you know, implementing or connecting DFSPs to real-time payment systems in, in Europe and Southeast Asia. How did you factor that into the design of payment hubs? So. Um. So the so let's say all of the bigger deployments uh, with, with all of these networks uh, and talking about, for example, Singapore or multiple countries in Europe, whenever a bank goes on this journey to connect to an instant payment solution, uh, it does apply some kind of payment hub. Uh, one feature that I not brought up uh, that some of the core banking platforms are not really 24 by 7. Meanwhile, the instant payment networks obviously require that we are always on. Um, and that's something that we can also bridge with the payment hub, having something like a shadow balance uh, system that we could take the incoming transactions while the core banking platform is doing batch processing or some ugly old fashioned uh, uh, processing or simply not available because of refresh or, or some other uh, processes. So that's where the payment hub comes into uh, the picture. And, and that's that where our solution could be applied. Thanks, Istvan. So I wanted to you know, set that point of context that we've really, although you know, the payment hub was originally designed to help you know, connect to Mojo Loop and help enable the underbank get connected to the digital economy, we really built it out with that scalability in mind. So, Godfrey, could you talk a little bit about the current state of the Mojo Loop project and how Payment Hub can accelerate adoption there? And it also would be good to touch on, you know, both Mojo Loop as like the basis of a centralized switch, but also the value that Mojo Loop provides to fintechs and others looking to have an interoperable payment rail to work from. So. Yeah, th thanks, Ed, for that. And yeah, essentially, as you might be aware, you know, Moja Loop was the latest, you know, revolution to, you know, piggyback at the current emerging RTPS systems globally. And before Moja Loop was actually brought to the fore, there were already projects in all the corners of the continent with the RTP systems that are really, really meant to be used um, in, in national use cases. And, and Moja Loop was brought in, you know, in line with the level one principles to, to really foster you know, the adoptions of, you know, inclusive financial services across the board, you know, to ensure that we have more and more interoperable systems to enable, you know, f and also to fuel, you know, the digital financial services to be really, 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 you know, interconnected. You know, so, so far there's a lot of use cases that uh, are out there, but Moja Loop has actually done a, a lot of groundwork in getting, you know, kind of like a, in country, and multi-provider P2P going. And this is really at the back of, you know, the success we've seen with uh, mobile money, the penetration that mobile money has, especially in West, you know, East Africa. And that's where the, the two, you know, biggest uh, module deployments from an African perspective. And bringing forth that into, you know, why the need for us to, to really, you know, enable everyone in the module loop ecosystem and in any RTP systems beyond with Payment Hub, it really helps to bridge that gap. It actually provides kind of like a, a much more broader set, you know, of integration to, to smaller fintechs that, that really, you know, can afford to build the wheels and vessels of the module loop API or anything equivalent. So module loop is actually kind of like a, came in at the right time to really help us to defrog and to working together 
with uh, the work we've done at MIFOS, you know, in terms of, you know, helping the, the digital financial systems to be prepared for the path of RTPs. That's where we came in, you know, to say, you know, RTPs connect systems and, uh, you know, Payment Hub and Finarak actually the, the holding forces to make sure that uh, DFSPs are prepared for that journey. Thanks, Godfrey. No, and we're looking forward to good cross-pollination between, you know, the Finaract and Mifos and Mojulu communities to really enable this last mile delivery through mobile money and other channels and the interoperability that can be enabled. And then, mm -hmm. Victor, like if you could just talk a little bit about the payments ecosystem in Mexico, because I know they've got pretty advanced infrastructure there and you've done a lot of innovative work leveraging Finaract to connect in there. Could, could you speak to your experiences in that regard? Hello, yes. Uh, we want to share our experience working with SPAY and CODI. Uh, SPAY is the interbank payment system in real time that is um, owned and developed by the central bank here in Mexico, which is called Bank Banxico also. And recently, uh, the central bank has uh, <coughs> created a, an extension for the mobile payments using QRs and near-field communications, which is called CODI. And we have found that um, that uh, MIFOS uh, uh, ecosystem, including Finerac as the core banking for the accounts, and the MIFOS payment hub as the payment switch, will fit uh, for this type of connection between the, uh, the smartphones and the devices. Um, also, the, the, the CODI ecosystem has uh, two big uh, use cases. One is the person-to-person, -person, and the other one is the merchants-to-person. So then the, the final, uh, uh, yes, right, right now the slide that is being presented is the model person-to-person. -person. In this way, the financial inclusion is being promoted using this um, platform. And we think that MIFOS Payment Hub and, and also the Apache Finera will help in this kind of financial inclusion because the cost of the licenses will, will, will have a, a, a better and substantive, uh, well, they can be a, a good competition for the existing solutions. And also, uh, we, we will uh, be focused in the in the second one, which is the merchant to persons. Because the the need of, of including the the merchants, the commerce, the stores here in, in Mexico and I think all around the world, they, they, they need to have the, the money in time because mo most of the the small business or micro business need the liquidity. So then uh, the real-time payment is a, a good example of how the institutions uh, at, uh, starting in Mexico will be uh, or will receive this kind of benefits of the technology using the open source and also through the experience and the sharing of knowledge with the partners of all around the world. Thank you, Victor, for sharing, you know, how you're leveraging both Finteract as well as Payment Hub to digitize that merchant payment experience. I'm gonna come back to you with another question in that regard, but, but Godfrey, you know, given your experience in Africa and the mobile money sector, can you speak to some of the challenges that are there to really digitize like the merchant payment experience? Because we do know, you know, that really is the holy grail of moving towards a more cashless economy by having that two-sided market get enabled. So can you speak to some of the challenges you've seen in digitizing those payments? Yeah, I think, you know, much more, it's much more deep to, you know, the first, uh, you know, milestone that we achieved in mainly in Africa. I mean, the, the biggest thing was to get everybody to be, you know, semi-banked and then have a mobile account or a wallet or everything else. Then now we created an ecosystem of, you know, a wallet cash in, cash out. And, and that's actually became a little bit more unsustainable for the ecosystem. And, you know, the idea to expand, you know, merchant payments, you know, to actually enable the ecosystems to, to keep everything in digital for a longer period 
actually becomes much more of the apparent need. And you know, the 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 bridge that we have actually provide for providers is really to get you know their payment ecosystem from a QR code perspective to be beyond just one you know QR code provider. So if you look at the landscape in, in any typical mobile money country you will have you know mobile money you know company one mobile company two when you visit a, a a merchant you know you have to actually take your phone and decide which ones to use and much of this is actually being eliminated with kind of like collapsing this you know through the use of you know the centralized technologies you know to enable you know cross functionings of uh, merchant payments and this is actually one of the biggest growth areas i mean you can even look in the card space I mean, Visa, Mastercard are looking in standardizing the QR code and just to make sure that you have one, you know, collapse means of uh, merchant payment. So this is one area wherein we could defrock, you know, from a, you know, digital financial inclusion, you know, from emerging technologies and fintech, we can quickly, you know, make use of this, you know, technology base to defrock and be able to be the first to solve that problem, you know, more, much more smarter and much more efficiently for the future. Thanks, Kadri. No, I'm really excited to see what, you know, with Finteract, with Mojaloop providing interoperability and with the Payment Hub, you know, providing that connection and orchestration, what we can do around enabling this two-sided market. Like, Victor, could you speak a little bit to, you know, some of, like, the innovation you've done around mobile wallets and some of the additional, you know, value-added services that could be provided to a consumer or to a merchant that could help to advance more of this digitization at the merchant payment level? Yes, uh, we have uh, created uh, mobile wallets in order to, for example, uh, allow the customers to go to the, to the stores to scan the, the barcodes of the, of the products. And of, of course, m most of the time, the, the products must be in a database. And uh, they, they add the, the products into the cart. So then at the end, or before moving uh, out of the store, they uh, request the, the payment and then they receive the, the note or the digital bill to be accepted or, or re rejected. This is um, a, a cashless uh, use case for using the mobile wallets uh, between the, the stores or merchants and the final consumers. And we have been uh, working in this uh, project using the Payment Hub and the Finerac as the accounting system. Thanks, Victor. And so we're gonna, you know, so we've already discussed as digitizing these merchant payment flows as being one of the ways to help to, you know, enable this transition to a cashless economy and all the benefits that entails. So I wanna, you know, go one step back again, you know, looking at another important use case on the payments front and everything that's happening around cross-border remittances as the panelists on the call have been a lot involved with ongoing efforts around ISO 222. And I know that got brought up in the earlier session with Graham. So Ishvan, could you speak a little bit to like what yourselves and the rest of our community has been working on regarding ISO 222 and how that factors into international payments? Yeah. Um, so once this payment hub was uh, created, then uh, we were kind of using the Mojalo network to do the payments. But uh, before, even before that, then uh, we participated in a couple of projects that the ISO 20 or 22 standard was used. So I would say that me and a couple of colleagues uh, got quite uh, familiar with the processes, created an instant payment simulator, created a couple of elements. So the whole um, ISO 20 or 22 space become quite familiar uh, for us. And as you could see on the diagram, that knowing all these uh, messages and having some of the tools to test uh, and drive uh, transactions, then we extended the payment hub uh, to use these standards. And then to, to showcase this, then actually we connected the ISO 20 or 22 network and the Mojalo network, so the transaction could go through, initiated from one country uh, using the ISO network, going to an intermediary, let's say, who who talks both uh, uh, specifications, let's say, and then receive the transaction, 
Um, now there's a little trick here that if a foreign exchange is required, then obviously this participant needs to do that. And after the foreign exchange, it could pass on this transaction to the target account, which is accessible via the Mojaloop network. So that's that's what the payment hub become uh, capable to bridging multiple of these uh, networks or simply participating in an ISO-based uh, communication, an ISO-based real-time payment network, and also in a Mojaloop-based uh, network. Okay, and then mm -hmm. how, how how production ready uh, Istvan is that ISO connector? So if there was you know a DFSP or a bank or a fintech that wanted to leverage that, like what could they do with it right now to date? Um, I would say that the basic transaction goes through, but for the ISO part, um, around the error handling, uh, probably some extra investment is uh, required in time, uh, but but the system is there. The the mechanism, what we are using is, is uh, simply the Java uh, stack that parsing the ISO message and using some of the attributes to drive the process flow. Um, uh, but, but the template and, and most of the features are, are there for the normal payment. Now, if we want to look out for request to pay and other workflows, uh, that, that requires enhancements in, in the connector. Thanks uh, for sharing that update, Ishvan. And then before we close on this point of the discussion, Godfrey, could you talk a little bit around, you know, if you're able to harness the data richness of the ISO 222 standard along with the Mojaloop API for last mile delivery, like what that could really enable for, you know, continents like Africa, but really any region with these remittance flows? Yeah, that, that is actually precisely one of the critical gaps, you know, you know that we bridge you know, using the payment hub. So if you look at the remittance uh, market today, it is actually a two-legged approach, wherein you send from one, you know, country where most African diaspora and South Asian are situated. Uh, then from then they are sending back onto the other network. So cross-pollination between the network, you know, handling, you know, different types of currencies and also, you know, the message type that will go back and forth. But very critical to that is really, you know, using Payment Hub to, to show the continuity of the transaction and be able to do notification across multiple hops. So this is actually very critical to encourage end-to-end -end solution in the remittance space so that, uh, you know, the, the fintechs can service their customers much more better. They could return much more kind of like richer notification, you know, making use of, you know, you know, the ISO 22,000 more rich message standards. So that actually will enable this uh, remittance market to service more than just P2P and move into, you know, the G2P and also, you know, P2C. So all the other different payment models will actually be enabled by, you know, a much more richer, you know, you know, middle equestration system that will be brought in by the payment hub. Thanks, thanks, Godfrey. So I'm gonna, I know we are gonna have to wrap up in about five minutes or so, but I wanted to move to probably the final point of our discussion and topic will be around open banking and payment initiation service uh, APIs. So Ishvan, I wanted you to open just by talking a little bit about the regulatory climate in the UK and Europe around open banking and PSD2 and what we've building been building out into the payment hub. Because I think everybody, you know, has been aware whether it's regulatory driven or market driven, there has been a lot of innovation and a lot of momentum around open banking and really, you know, starting to transform uh, the payments landscape and really starting to eat away at a lot of the card-based payments that are so prominent right now. So yeah. Um, so the concept actually sounds simple. A bank should provide APIs that other could innovate on top. So provide more advanced services that the bank is capable to do. But obviously, none of the banks willing to just open up their systems because they are protecting their customers, all the knowledge on all of those transactions. So, so that's the innovation remains siloed. And now the regulators, at least in Europe, they were saying that now, guys, we're forcing you to open up because that will give Europe that benefit 
that other players could come uh, to the party and could provide better service to the customers that they're looking for. And two kind of services, let's say, one is the uh, payment initiations, the, those parties that, that will provide a better platform, a better service or communication across multiple institutions to initiate a payment. So instead of a credit card, um, I could just authorize this FinTech uh, to initiate a payment on my behalf of any of the institutions that I have an account. So all the fancy technologies we go out and, and all the related things comes into this uh, era. Um, and another type of service that these providers could uh, do, the account information service providers. So they aggregate the account information across multiple systems. For a corporate, it could be an ERP system, which gets the paid invoices uh, from the bank via API instead of a PDF file and humans keying in. Um, or for a human, it could be just like aggregation of course, multiple accounts and showing nice charts uh, that can be an innovative service. So that's the landscape. Obviously, the regulators cannot push standardization on the APIs. That's probably too much for the regulators, but there are um, multiple standards emerging. And one of them is the open banking API, which gives a good set of services uh, that if a bank adopts, then the third parties uh, could consume. So that's uh, where we are. And, and other areas on the globe uh, also recognizing that opening up APIs, some for free, if the regulator is pushing, but some for money. So even calling the services could be charged. Uh, that's starting to make sense and, and the banks uh, getting into this era. Thanks, Ishvan. And yeah, so we are, you know, at the community level trying to carve out and publish a set of APIs through an API gateway that adhere to this UK open banking API format. And we're also trying to work on some reference mobile apps that can serve as fintech apps to consume any open banking API. And then Victor, I know in Mexico, there's some pretty advanced uh, fintech laws. And I know they're also looking at adopting the UK open banking standard. Can you talk a little bit around what's going on in open banking down in Mexico? Yes, here the uh, National Commission uh, for, for Bankings are uh, using the United Kingdom uh, open standards. So this is the, the model that the, all the banks need to implement uh, and the payments initiation is one of the, the standards that uh, are being implemented right now here, here in Mexico because this is the for, for, for the banks and the regulated institutions. Uh, is that the model that they are following for uh, implementing this first set of uh, open standards? Okay, thank you. And I think most of the questions in the chat, we had covered in the chat. So I'm gonna use this last minute to let Godfrey talk a little bit about some of the efforts around the PISP API that Google has been leading as part of like their efforts with, with Mojuloop. Do you want to speak to those uh, efforts, Godfrey? So. Yeah, so that is actually being one of the ways uh, the real-time payment network could be accelerated. If you look at the original conceptions and models of real-time payments was just to get money moving between providers you know, at a fast, you know, like a in a real time, you know, cross settlement switch of the past. But with the payment initiation, we are now actually able to allow fintechs to connect to the core of the real time payment network, which actually will help the adoptions and, and, and foster more and more participation in real time payment network. And PSP wouldn't be a reality if it's riding over a system that is not uh, real time and synchronous, like Isben has mentioned. So it, it, will, it will have a very little value over and above what the bank can provide if it wasn't, you know, the underlying real time payment system. And Mojo Loop has actually, you know, identified that gap and working with Google, you know, based on their success in India UPI system, we will manage to really have a use case that is really connected to, 
you know, the Moise Loop ecosystem. And also Payment Hub as well can play a part in terms of the smaller fintechs that really don't have a richer kind of like a, a orchestration platform, a collaboration that could help the, the notification between the PSP providers and the, the bank account holders. And this is very critical. And the two focal point of, you know, Moise Loop PSP is really to, you know, bring in the customers directly into the ecosystem, enhance customer experience and, and make sure that, you know, the real time payment is accelerated and also to increase the level of trust in digital payments, you know, to, you know, help the fact that uh, the accounts are there, you know, mobile money accounts are there, bank accounts are there, but just to actually take that, digitize them, allow fintechs to access them as they want, but in a much more secure manner, you know have a very robust security systems on top of uh, the PSP model, allow, you know, easier way to, you know, establish trust, you know, between PSP providers, you know, which are the app providers, as well as the account holders on the customer side. So all, all that work, you know, in making sure that, you know, this is much more user friendly and this is much more secure and trusted has been done at the module loop level and, and is much more ready for test and adoption, you know, going forward. Well, thank, thanks, Godfrey. And I think we're getting to the end of the time. So I just wanted to, you know, wrap and, you know, invite all our attendees to start, you know, looking at if you're not aware of the Payment Hub or becoming, you know, upstream contributors or users of the Payment Hub, because we really have built it out, you know, as this very sophisticated, scalable, yet extensible and flexible orchestration engine to be, you know, quite agnostic in terms of what core banking system it connects to. But by, of course, you know, optimizing it for the Finteract architecture, but being agnostic of whatever, you know, payment rail it needs to connect to. But we do believe it can help to, you know, power all those fintechs that are starting to use Finteract and really enable, you know, the legacy and modern financial institutions as well to, you know, take advantage of all the innovation that's occurring around real-time payments, you know, adoption of the ISO 222 standard, everything that's happening around open banking. So we do believe Payment Hub is going to be another one of these critical open source building blocks and we're looking forward to you know growing the community around it and sharing more of the documentation and getting everyone involved so i want to thank you know ishvan godfrey and victor for being on the panel and then we've got a good panel that james is going to be leading coming up next around finract for regulated credit unions and at the end of the day we're going to close with a session on looking at finract across uh, africa and we'll touch on a number of these items related to payments there too I want to thank everybody for being on the panel and we'll send more links to the slides and documentation later. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye-bye. Take Bye. care. Bye-bye. Cheers, Matt.